Can y'all hear me? Yes, no? No? Yes? All right. So thank you for volunteering for be my slide guy. My name is Scott Lundgren. I am in San Antonio with Carbon Black. We're a couple-year-old company doing what we call endpoint visibility, but this brief, brief rather, presentation is not about the company. I'm on the wrong side, aren't I? We'll see on this side. So I got it. Yeah. So a little bit about my background. Um, I've been doing software for close to 20 years um, and security software for more like um, 15. I started at Microsoft and then have been doing some uh, some interesting work in the federal government kind of programs, um, some out of San Antonio and some out of Washington, D.C. And then now I'm with Carbon Black. So what I'm... I guess the key point here, what I'm trying to talk about today is what I call or what is called the assumption of breach, which is the, the fundamental tenet here is, is that bad stuff happens and you can't help it, right? In, in the real world, it's going to happen. It has happened. It will happen. And you really can't win um, if you're going to try to say, as long as my network is connected to anything, then I'm going to make it 100% secure. It's not going to happen. And I'm going to try to talk through that, not from a technical perspective, per se, as in like, well, here's some bits and here's how we can move them in order to get them somewhere, but rather more of a process and motivation and kind of almost psychological um, perspective, which is you've got good stuff, bad guys want it, it's going to happen. So the basic idea here is, is that your network, whatever you're trying to defend one way or another, is going to be um, either targeted by somebody specific or you're going to be under more general attack, right? Just someone who's looking for something, a target of opportunity. And sometimes when you think you found something and you think it's a target of opportunity and you're not targeted, you in fact are targeted because the guy on the other side has thought all that through and is making his stuff look like general stuff. Is that track? Slide, please. Yeah, this is the basic point right here. So my, my basic argument here is there's no way around it, right? Past tense, future tense, present tense, present progressive, all those tenses, it's happening right now. If you don't agree with me, I guess, then we probably don't have much to talk about in the sense that, you know, this is, this is, this is where I come out and this, the rest of this presentation is about this. And yeah, it happens a lot of ways, right? We all know that. One more. So this is... I got that from a buddy of mine who uh, has a 800 acre farm in Illinois and uh, that's his, uh, that's what he says all the time. And <laughs> that is. <laughs> What's wrong with that? <laughs> the, uh, um, there's no, we know this, right? There's no way around it. Um, as long as you have people on the other end of it, they're going to do things you don't want them to. You can write more rules, right? You can add more policy and what's it mean, right? Not much. Um, and I say this, you know, as, me, as legitimate as I can on the basis that I mean, I'm the director of engineering. So what does that mean? I have people that are working for me, right, reporting to me that are software engineers. They write code for a living. Every time we try to lock something down internally on our network, right, what do they do? They complain about it because it takes them more time to do their job. Where, where, where does that leave me, right? I have to balance real world. So eventually, at some point, someone, the more I lock it down, the more likely they are not to tell me what they're doing. Just how it goes. <laughs> So from an attacker perspective, right, if you want to do it low and slow, right, if you want to like just go in nice and easy, right, if you say, hey, I don't need to get in that network or on that box or on that server right this second, I'm going to wait a little bit, then some model looks like this, which is let me figure out what's going on on that computer, what's it look like, what software is it running, um, what's the policy in terms of how quickly patches can get turned around? Um, and I can wait, because I'm the bad guy. I can wait for potentially a very long time. And then when the time is right, as we'll discuss later, then I can move, right? Um, you don't really have a shot against this. Um, so here's, these are just some, present, uh, some stats on Java. We all know Java's a problem in terms of, I'm not making any judgment about Java the runtime or the language of the company, right? the separate discussion. I'm just talking about Java in terms of how it's actually deployed in the real world. Right? And, and the issue is, is that there are obviously, just based on the stats, there are real holes in Java that occur regularly and have occurred regularly over a very long period of time. Like, let's measure it in decades now, right? So a very long period of time. And it's really hard to keep the thing up to date. I'm not saying that's because somebody's incompetent or what. Practical, I mean, I'm just looking at the numbers, right? There's lots of versions out there, and most of them are vulnerable to public Exploits, right? Real world, bottom line, that's how it goes. 
like say for example 77 percent right? so and that's you know in you know in our in, from a carbon black perspective we sometimes have pretty good visibility into what's going on in some of our customer networks and we see numbers all over the map so i've seen numbers as low as in the one to two percent range and that's great um and as high as 100 percent right and uh, that 100 percent is pretty concerning especially when you, know, you go through all the work of saying hey Hey guys, we've got to do something about this. Right, 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 we're going to do it. And you go over two months, right, and you finally get all that gets done, and they have it patched, and then next month you start all over again because they didn't institutionalize any of it, right? And so next month we do it all over again. It's a hard problem. Yeah, it's a lot of stuff, right? <laughs> it's a fancy graph to say um, there's a lot of things. This is Android and iPhone in particular, um, but the basic gist is it's more it's just more evidence to support the fact that there's a lot of software out there. Software has a lot of lines of code in it. It's hard to keep software up to date. It's hard to keep it all in your head. Even if you think you have it all in your head, you don't. That's that's human. That's human nature. So, going back to that first slide or second slide where I said something like. Well, there's targeted, right? We could be targeted or we could not be targeted, target of opportunity, and then the asterisks. So the hide and plain sight is kind of wild. Take a little side john here and talk through. Um, let's say I'm a bad guy, and you guys, the whole audience, are tasked with defending some network, and I'm trying to get into it, right? And my goal, of course, is to steal something, right? And let's just say, my goal is to steal data from that server all the way over there. It looks about like a video camera. And I, we all agree, right, that eventually, one way or another, I'll get into the network. But from my perspective, this is just cost benefit, right? I just want to get that data, and I want to get that data as cheaply as I can, right, as effectively as I can. I could spend a lot of time and effort to write a whole custom attack chain, right, from zero day exploit all the way through some sort of data exfil, rootkit kind of stuff, right, all sorts of really clever stuff. I could, I could have eight guys working around the clock building all that custom tool sets never been seen before, and I can lay it down in this network, and you guys have no chance because no one's ever written a signature because no one's ever seen it before because I wrote all this just to get into your network, right? Or I could take some stuff off the street, repurpose it in three days, right? And if I do a good enough job of making it look like the public stuff, when you find it, you say, oh, look at this. It's just common grade, you know, non-targeted malware. No big deal. Just reimage the box, pull it off of there, right? And so in that case, I got what I wanted, right? I got the data I wanted. You found me. You had no attribution. You had no idea that I'm actually a very sophisticated, very targeted adversary. And you chalk it up to no big deal. Is that kind of making sense? Sorry. So that's my bottom line right there um, in two cliches. So where there's a will, there's a way. And we know this is how that works, right? If there's a profit motive somewhere, someone will figure out how to exploit it. We don't need software, computer, security, any of that stuff. Throw that all out. Human nature. If there's a will, there's a way. And then number two, there's more than one way to skin a cat, which is no matter what you're going to do right, in terms of trying to defend your network, you're doing this with a barrel of holes in it, right? And there's always more popping out somewhere else. And the more tightly you get some stuff, the more attractive it is for the bad guy to go at this, some other vector. One more. So we know there's public, you know, there's a public market for zero days. We'll talk about that in a second. It's not novel at all. Um, we know that there's a lot of ways to more than one way to skin a cat, right? There's a lot of ways to get onto the network in the first place, right? So, and some of those are very sophisticated and some of those are extremely unsophisticated. We know all that. Um, but even if somehow you manage to patch everything from Java on up, right, and you have all the rules in place and everything's all laid out, you still can't win. Right? You still can't win. It's not going to happen. Because, remember, I'm the attacker again. I'm doing cost, my cost-benefit analysis, right? And I say, I want to get on this network and what you have on this network is, to me, right, worth 250K, right, let's just say. Um, and, you know, because we definitely, let's pause for a second. We definitely have a kind of a case where I'm, I'm a technical bad guy, right? I, I'm a hacker. I break into things. And so my, that's what I know how to do. Uh, but I don't myself necessarily want the data that's on that server myself because all I really want is to write code and break into things. But I do want a paycheck. Right? So one way or another, I am contracted by somebody else to go fetch that. Right? And so when it comes down to it, um, if I have a 250K payoff, and I fingerprint, and I look around, and I see that everything's secure, and it's not going to work, I say, well, my $10,000 plan is not going to work. But I can go on the zero-day market, pick up something for 100 k pop it, hop in, grab the data, get out, I'm still 150K the richer. Right? It's a good deal. It's the same way you and I work in a 
you know, with our personal lives and how everyone works with cost-benefit analysis. So here's the zero-day initiative. I'm assuming most of you are familiar with this, at least in principle, right? You know, it's this is just an example, right? Um, there's, it's not that hard to still these days, right? To find things, um, all the major software vendors have come a very, very long way. Um, I've been part of that, you know, very small part of that in my career over the years of trying to bring um, commercial software, enterprise software forward in terms of its resiliency to attack. There's no way around the fact that in 10 years the industry has come a long way. But it's not enough, right? Like it isn't like the gates are now high enough. And in my opinion, this is you know again my opinion, but I feel like it goes back to if there's a will, there's a way, right? I mean, it's still it's still going to happen. We just keep moving it up, but it's a never-ending race. One more, one more. So um, the name that was highlighted in red that I passed over so quickly that you know is just one name at random. Google first hit. One more. Or, I'm sorry, fourth, one more. Maybe that's same maybe it's not. I'm not picking on this guy, right? The the key is is that there's a market out there. And why is there a market? Because someone's buying it, right? There's a buyer and a seller. And why, why do they want to buy it, right? Well, there's the whole business of governments buying it, like throw them out, right? Let's just worry about the bad, legitimate bad guys in terms of our perspective in the commercial world trying to defend networks. Why are they buying it? Because someone else is paying somebody else to go get something, right? And it's worth the cost to go pick up the, buy something. So whenever there's worth the cost, there's a market, when there's a market, people spring up to fill the holes. And if they spring up to fill the holes, they do that wherever it's most cost effective. So they might be in the United States or they might be overseas. It's just a market. One, two, three, four, five. Thank you. So here's some you know, total ballpark figures on cost, right? Um, let's pick a number somewhere in the middle and say 50K. Um, you know, market this market in particular because it is a black market, right? It is under the covers a little bit, so therefore it is not a very efficient market, right? So because it's not easy to, you know, 100% easy to kind of match buyers and sellers, there can be some discrepancies in how much people are paying for the same thing. That's okay, but we get an order of magnitude out of this, right? And these numbers are not all that high, right? Um, if, for example, I'm on task with defending a network that has intellectual property of substance, so I'm going to totally make something up here and say, I'm a drug company, and I have some, some I'm not a chemist, right, so I don't know anything about this, but I have some recipe right, for here's what a drug is, here's, here's what went into it, here's the process, the manufacturing process, here's what I need to do in order to make it, and all of that is all put together, that's worth a lot of money especially to an overseas uh, generic drug type maker that is willing to flout you know, US intellectual property rules. And that's worth way more than $200,000. It's not even close. In the old days, right, prior to all this stuff, how did, how did intellectual property theft like this happen? Like, using the drug example. It happened when I'm the first world drug company, I make the drug, somebody, in the, somebody else procures the drug, gets a prescription even, right? hires a couple biochemists and says, hey, Figure that out, reverse engineer that. And they go through a process and they figure it out and then they come back six months later and they say, hey, here's how to make it, right? And then we try to make it, but we have some little you know, struggles in the manufacturing process, just like as if we were making it ourselves. But now it's a year later and we have it. Now we can skip the chemist altogether, right? Just hire somebody on the black market to go hop onto that server again. The server's getting a lot of use. And, you know, pop those, pop those server, grab the data, bring it all back. Now I have the whole process documented for me from beginning to end, ready to go, ready to use right now. Right. If that's two hundred fifty thousand um, dollars, I'm sorry. If the cost to get that initial access, with right now, right, not wait, not fingerprint and wait for some public bond to happen in the in the patch cycle to, to not have a lapse yet, just to go right now is only two hundred fifty thousand dollars. There's there's no way. Right. I think it's saying the same thing here again. Um, cheap, good. I've already covered that. Same point again, hasn't changed. So detection bypass that will, so that's a kind of a, a bold statement, right? So I, I for example, I'm in the, in the uh, um, computer security business. So if you, if you read that literally, you say, well, what's the point? Why would we even have any revenue, <laughs> right? If it's all by will, then what's, what's the point? To a certain degree, that's, that's true, right? If the attacker is sufficiently skilled and sufficiently motivated, you got no shot, right? So it's kind of like, uh, let's draw the line somewhere. So maybe we'll say that detection passed 
at will with motivation, right, and resources. But those motivation resources aren't all that high. Mike, we're okay so far. So, okay, so let me repeat that because I learned that once in a speaking class. So let's repeat the question. So prevention bypassed at will. So I'll, I'll, buy, I'll meet you in the middle. Um, how about that? And we'll say both. Right, so prevention can happen because you have the ability to detect, right? Or would have the ability to detect if you knew. You've detected even in the past tense to say this class of attacks, right, is looks like this. So therefore I can put a safeguard that protects against this class. But it assumes that I know what safeguard I'm putting in place to protect against. That I understand what's coming at me so that I can put that wall there. If I have no idea that people are walking through this door all the time, I don't, I don't even know to try to prevent something here. So I guess I'll, I'll meet you in the middle and say, generally speaking, the idea that we can say, we're going to put up the walls, we're going to stop people from getting in, we're going to know when they even try, is not true, at least in the 100% case. So here are kind of like the two core pillars, I would say, of modern network defense. And I want to be very clear in case I say anything a minute from now that is contrary to this, that I'm not saying that both of these don't have value because they have incredible value. Just period, you know, bottom line. Um, so when we say host space antivirus, right, we need something on the endpoint on the host that is doing something, right, and there's lots of different ways that it can be done. But broadly, you're looking at some sort of signature that is some combination of fixed static signatures, like as simple as a hash, or something as complicated as some crazy heuristics that, you know, three or four PhD types spent six months writing, right, Any, anywhere in there. Well, on the other side, we can say, just look at the packets that are coming and going, right? Maybe at their perimeter, maybe on a kind of key internal internal network kind of spots. Let's watch things as they come and go. Um, again, we can look at signatures. You know, that stream of bytes is bad. The stream of bytes that looks about like this in a fuzzy kind of way, that's bad. Or you can do the kind of thing that's really neat that people are doing in the last number of years um, where we say, hey, let's, let's not even use kind of static analysis, what we'd say on the forensic side, static analysis. Let's not just carve out some sort of payload off the wire and just look at it. Let's actually pick it up, drop it over into some runtime, some dynamic, some sandbox kind of environment, right, and make it go, and then watch what happens, right? And if we do that, at that point, we, you know, have a lot better understanding, maybe, maybe, if we do it right, of whether this thing is malicious or at least suspicious. And you put all that together, and that's great stuff. It's great stuff. But uh, I don't think it's enough. Oh, sorry, if you don't mind the scale. I mean, not that that's hard to read, but the, uh, the, uh, the scale thing I want to bring up, because it's not, it's not a question of whether or not anything that anyone's doing in the past tense or in the present tense or in the future tense by any vendor, you know, myself or anybody else, is whether it's, not, it's a good idea in theory. The scale thing just makes it hard, right? It's the whole idea of, like, you have a network device and it, it does a great job of carving all this stuff out and all these people spend all this time writing all this code to carve all this stuff out and run it and make all these determinations and it's great work all the way around and you get 4,527 alerts a day. Like, what do you do with that? I mean, what do you, I mean what, in a practical sense, what do you do with that? So just because you have the right idea and you know what you want to do, you can't actually apply it to the problem that's there in front of you because it's just too big. So this, this it just makes everything worse, right? <laughs> So who knows where they got that number, right? 286 million variants, whatever that means. I think the, the key thing is there's a lot, right? <laughs> there's a lot and it's way too many to like write down, right? I can't just say, well, I'm gonna create a list of 286 million hashes and then keep it up to date somehow and always use it. Like it's not gonna happen. So this is fun, this is fun. So just let's just read this for a second. A network security monitor and if you read this, um, I'm not going to ask you to read it, just take my word for it. Um, it looks kind of like a lot like some of the, not a lot, a lot of the uh, um, uh, network perimeter devices that are on the market right now. No, again, nothing disparaging whatsoever. But look at the date. 1990. So I got cut off on the bottom here. But the interesting thing here is 1989 was the 100,000th you know, node with an IP right, on the internet. And 91, if I remember correctly, was when kind of the internet opened to commercialization. This paper was published in the middle of that. It gives you an idea of, of how little the thinking, the big picture thinking behind network, network level security has changed since that time. Nothing wrong with that, right? So as I say all the time, I'm in engineering after all, ideas are cheap, right? Execution's expensive, right? So, but this is where we are. 
and that's the big question. Right? So if whatever your, your strategy for trying to defend your network involves any kind of signature, it's what, you know, a, a fixed signature like a hash, or a fixed signature like these stream of bytes, or a stream of bytes that meet these requirements, or even something like, let me pull the thing out, run it in a sandbox, execute it, and then if it does things about like this and about like that and about that order, then we'll call it suspicious. Any of those combination, right? Fundamentally, though, someone had to come up with an idea that that is bad and this is good, right? Or at least that is bad and by extension, this must not be bad. Or at least we don't think it's bad. And it's a real problem, right? It's a real problem when someone, the bad person, is writing it for the first time. There's, there's nothing to be done there, right? And, and what makes our field, I think, just so fun, I know it's not fun when we're in it all day, but like in theory fun, right, is that it's one of the rare fields where you have challenges that are changing, but that's common in a lot of industries, right? But they're changing because there's a person on the other side that's very smart and very motivated trying to outsmart you, right? Like again, I don't know anything about, I know nothing whatsoever, right, about the drug industry, you know, uh, pharmaceuticals. And I know that people who are very, very smart work very, very hard to come up with clever stuff. But fundamentally, the chemistry behind it um, generally speaking, I'm guessing, isn't changing a lot. Maybe some of like the, you know, antiviral, anti-HIV, anything where like you have an active agent on the other end is changing, but it's not changing at the speed that humans change, right? And that's really neat stuff. Yeah, we know that. And that's the bottom line, said another way by somebody who has more clout than me, right? So the, and it was even said in the past tense, so I can't even say I have any novel idea here. So the idea, though, is that I think we have to come to this conclusion. So let's talk about the time, right? So what I have here is like just order of magnitude timeline, obviously. Compromise in seconds. So what does that mean? Well, that, I mean, we just got done saying that the, you know, the bad guy might be lying and wait for hours or weeks or months. But once the actual attack starts, compromise doesn't take very long. Generally, that initial toehold into a network quick. Um, once that toehold is achieved, data exfiltration, so grabbing up cop files and such and pushing them out can happen quickly. Does it happen quickly? It depends. At the end of the day, there are people and processes on the other end, right? Just like we have people and processes on our side, they have people and processes on their side. They might have a team that says, I'm team one, I get initial execution, access, endpoint, you know, I, I got a toehold on that network. And then I pass it off to somebody else, right? Who knows how long it's going to take. But once they can go to start right away, then it's hard for us to detect that, right? If we're lucky, we can detect it right away. If we're lucky, the actual payload that came in was pulled off by our network device, and two minutes after it came in, we got, you know, detected. But if we're unlucky, it could be sitting there for months, months, and months at a time, right? And we know that happens. And then trying to fix it takes a while, right? Just the act of trying to decide politically, organizationally, what to do about it. You think you found it, but you're not quite sure. And then what do we do? What do you just pull the whole network off, offline? Well, probably not, right? So now we actually have to do something. When are we going to do it? How fast are we going to do it? Who's going to do it? Are we going to get the manpower? Do we have to subcontract out? Right? Oh, now I got stuck in purchasing, right? I mean, all that kind of mess, right? Um, and then it costs a lot by the time we're done. And that's just for one incident. If I got 10,000 endpoints lying around and I can assume that they're all being attacked numerous times a day, that is, it's not going to work. <laughs> Yeah, so this is a, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't make any slides, don't blame me. So, um, I mean, this is a kind of a hoity toity way of saying, in my opinion, a way of saying if you come from a background where your goal is to establish an analogy, right, a, a real world, a physical analogy to a network security problem, a pretty common analogy is some variation of castle, moat gate, wall, right? Some sort of, you know, protection, right? And, and, the, and the good people are inside and we're hunkered down and we're protected and the bad people are outside, barbarians at the gate and they're out there. Once you establish that metaphor, it's very hard to break that, right? Because you think constantly about raising the wall in some way or another, maybe making it thicker, right? Or, or closing down the size of the, 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 the holes, right? The size of the door. And that's great and it all needs to be done, but it it leaves us vulnerable mentally to the idea that, that we don't recognize that the fifth column, right, is already on the inside, and there isn't just one of them. They're all over the place. And it's, it, that, that's just how it is. All right. So, skip one more if you don't mind, actually. So, you know, what are the barriers for us being able to address this kind of problem? The technical barrier is just the barrier to, like, kind of get into the scale problem. 
I mean, at the end of the day, even if you know exactly what you want to do, you can't just stare at a Cat5 cable and, and, and figure it out, right? You need some sort of, you need some sort of tools and, and, and software and hardware and stuff, right, to help make sense of all that data. Um, there's some legal constraints. I'm going to make that just bigger and say political constraints. You know what you want to do. You know exactly what you want to do, and you're right. And your budget is one tenth of what you need it to be to even think about doing it. Right? And time is a variation of the other thing. Right? No one has enough time on principle ever. One more. All right. So this is my next kind of, um, I guess, assertion. Right? And my assertion is is that. Because I don't know this, I don't have a, I don't have like a um, insider view of what every organization's budget is looking like, right? But um, from my experience and from some other data points that we've dug up, um, it seems like the balance, and that zero percent is obviously excessive, right? But the balance of of effort in terms of dollars and time and everything that's going into this whole process of defense is moving to the far left, as we call it, on prevention. And that initial detection, that initial detection of, of some sort of exploit or the delivery of a zip file with some sort of malicious software in it, or et cetera, et cetera, right? That initial catch. Let's try to really focus on that wall, that initial cut. And after that, we fade off pretty fast. And when you think about it, you know, you, you buy a, a couple, you know, network perimeter devices, you know, at 50K each, right? And then you buy some uh, uh, antivirus software and you're paying 50K for that. And then you have three or four people that are, you know, tasked all day, every day with kind of maintaining all of that. Let's say they're all making 80K each, right? You multiply all that together and that gets a pretty big chunk of money. So my basic argument is, is that, and, and I want to be fair here, right? I'm not saying that, that money is wasted, right? I'm not saying anything here. I'm just saying though that by putting all the effort there to the left, you're, we're putting blinders on our ability to see what's going on already, right? And I'm not even sure what the right thing to do is because if you open up your eyes and you find a bunch of bad stuff, we don't have any way to deal with it. So what, right? Like all you know now is you have more bad news, and you go home on the weekend, and you feel more stressed, and you still can't change anything. So I don't, it's not as easy as just saying, "Well, just move the money to the right, and everything goes away." On their hand, the first I, I feel like the first thing to to kind of recognize is if you if you view the world like this, then you realize that. that it's got to at least get flattened a little bit to even have a shot. Yeah, if it's attacked, if you don't do anything, you're liable for That's right. <laughs> One more. So, I mean, way back when, by way back when, I mean about 10 years ago, um, on a personal note, right, I had not been in the, I've been in the software business, right, but not in the, um, security business. So like at Microsoft, for example, I worked on the stunningly successful, wildly popular Windows Media DRM team. So digital rights management. Right? And not only that, I was not on the core team, because that would have been too cool. Instead, I was on the special team that was trying to port that to portable devices like cell phones. This is back in like 2001. And that was so wildly successful that you're all using that technology today. <laughs> So the point was, is I'd written software at you know some well, you know big companies, small companies. I've been in that that line of work, and then all of a sudden, through kind of a twist of fate on my personal side, I end up doing this network security assessment kind of stuff, and it blew my mind. Right, it blew my mind. Um, I remember the first time I went in an assessment. This is about two weeks after I was hired. I you know it is two weeks into a new job. You don't know first thing from anything, and I sat down next to someone who'd been there five or six years, and he was using Wireshark. I said, "This is the coolest thing in the world," right? Like, <laughs> Because I had done socket programming for years, right? And I, I knew in principle how TCP worked, but I'd never seen a visualization of a packet ever, right? And the fact that you could see that and you could like right click and filter, and it was just, and this is the whole world's right here. And then you find out that there's tools that can see inside of our operating system, right? Like on Windows, you would say like the system terminals tools, right? Like look at that, it's all right there. You just download it and run it, and you can suddenly discover all the stuff that used to be a black box. And then you start figuring out, and this is how you take advantage of that in order to do, you know, bad things. And so, of course, we want to do all this kind of stuff. I don't do this stuff anymore, but you know, you want to do all this stuff. Um, and at the very least, you know, you, the real key here, and this is the, again, it's a hard part, um, particularly for management to make, right? Is you actually you're really focused on trying to get results that are reflective of what your actual problems are, right? And there's kind of a natural counter incentive because. If you go through and you, you pay the 100,000 bucks for the assessment and you get back a, hey, you guys did pretty well, you want to fix up that, you want to fix up that, and other than that, you're good, then everyone can go home and feel happy, right? But you didn't solve the damn problem. 
And, and, and so you kind of have to be motivated to say, dig deeper, be self-critical, and go figure this stuff out. And that's hard, because it's not lined up with what you actually want to do in terms of making your job easier. One more. How am I doing on time? Plenty of time. All right. Good. So let's walk through the bad guy. You know, this is another little bad guy. Um, I'm going to walk through this. I didn't make this graph. And then I'm going to walk through it again and then kind of show you that it's, it's uh, worse than it sounds even. So we send something. Let's just call it a zip file. Throw down a common remote access tool. Number three, there lateral movement. There's actually kind of two levels in that particular bar. There's kind of gain admin or gain root. I have a local box. Um, and then spread out a little bit. Right? So now you have a toehold on more than one box. Right? Then you find some data. That's number four. Find some data. Exfiltrate it. And then it's gone. Right? It's actually even easier than that because you don't really even always need to do this part. Right? Because cost benefit analysis right? from the bad guy. I can create a sophisticated rootkit that's advanced and persistent, right? So it's going to stick around as the box reboots 55 times. I can, right? Or I can just send an email again, right? Or I can just act quickly, right? And, and do I need admin on my box? Well, no, because where's all my data? I'm the CFO of my organization. Where's all my data? Does it lock down so that only admin can read it? Obviously not, because then I have to be admin in order to get on the box, right? So all I have to do is go to the My Documents directory. All I have to do is go to the Z drive, say dir. Dur star interesting star enter for each send it out. Right? I don't need I, mean, I don't need any kind of kernel access. Right? I don't need anything special. Right? Um, and I already have all the data. That's the whole. You guys remember the whole Internet Explorer with Vista and it had the low writes mode. You know what I mean by that? Right? It kind of dropped itself down so that you couldn't write to your personal, you know, to your My Documents directory. And that's a good thing. I'm not blaming Microsoft for that at all. It's a good thing. But it's kind of aside the point from an exfiltration point of view because you still have read access. <laughs> right? You know you still have read access because you can go to Gmail and say attach. Right? And then you can go to your directory and pull it all up. And so it's, it's really not that hard. Right? It's really not that hard. So there's the detection, and this is the hard part. Right? And again, from an attacker point of view, this can happen very, very quickly. Once this happens, you can you know, go by a long time. Um, you can do something sophisticated with advanced persistent, you know, very sophisticated, like lay down a whole series of root rootkits on 25 boxes that have never before been seen, right? And even the most advanced anti-rootkit technology can't find it, theoretically, right? Or let's say you have rooming profiles on in your organization. Reasonable bet, right? I could copy an executable to the startup folder. Right? Copy. Copy file, right? And there it is. And then whenever I log in anywhere, rooming profile comes with it and it starts up. Right? That's not sophisticated. That cost me maybe 18 seconds of coding, right? And, and it, it works. Right. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, I gotta have the ice bird. <laughs> I love the guy who put this together. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, we see all that. So, bottom line, right, we, we agree that we have to detect. I mean, everyone agrees that, right? We can't just pretend that we're not going to look at it. On the other hand, we have to say that's just starting. It's just the tip of the iceberg, right? It's just the beginning. We have to keep going from that point. One more. If one more, hopefully something in red comes up that will remind me what I'm doing. Right. This. This one right here. So when you're in the business of um, you know, you, you're doing your best to prevent and detect. You're doing your best, you're doing your best, you're doing your best. But you messed up once in a while, right? Maybe because the tools weren't good enough, probably. Or maybe because you got lazy and didn't show up for work for three days, probably. Right? You know, any number of things, right? But eventually somebody gets in. Um, maybe you're doing your job as best you can, you just you don't have enough of you, right? Um, or maybe you're just outsmarted, right? Which is not a sign of shame, right? The other person on the other end is highly intelligent, highly motivated, does this for a living. Right? You're trying to defend this breath, they're attacking like this. When you find out something happened, you think, oh no, that computer over there, we're pretty sure that's been compromised. For all we know, all these computers are compromised, but we minimally know that this one's compromised. What do we do? Right? And, and the answer is, is that, of course, you can go and clean it, but if you actually want to figure out what happened, oftentimes you're stuck with file system forensics, right? Which would be something like take the box offline, pull the drive out, make a copy, and then either you have in-house expertise or you don't. If you don't, you're kind of out of luck because now you're paying some unreasonable amount per hour, right, for somebody very motivated, very smart, I'm not criticizing that industry either, um, to dig apart bit by bit and try to use, you know, expensive software to analyze a disk to hopefully find out some trace of what happened maybe months ago, 
right? And they might find it, they might not. They might find something and think they have it, but they might be wrong because all the data wasn't there, not their fault, right? Et cetera, et cetera. It's very cumbersome. So what do you do to get prepared when your answer is, look for the detection, you know, try to detect it on first access, oh, missed it, then wait months until it smacks you in the face, and then try to go back and look at what's on the disk that hopefully is going to recreate the steps from seven months ago till now. Right? That's what I'm saying is like a, a common kind of workflow. So what can we do with that? That's better than that. That's reasonable. All right, so this makes sense. <laughs> this is good stuff. Right? I don't actually drink it, but I'm a software guy, so I ought to be drinking Mountain Dew, right? So the, uh, the, uh, that's the good stuff. And then, next, and then he, that, that's your network. That's what you're trying to defend. And this, right? We're all here. We're all network defenders, right? This is our view of our network. And the key is what's right back there? Right? What's right, right on that aisle right, where you can't see? I don't know. Next slide. That's not actually the same picture because I can't find two things on Google, but like, just work with me, right? The key is, is that if you only got eyes from one place, right, if you only have high level eyes from one place, you're only going to see some, some subset of it. If you have cameras, I'll call it out conveniently there in the top right, everywhere, right, then you can see more places. Not novel, right? Not clever. So then I get my one slide pitch, right? Which is, and, and we're not the only company doing this, um, but the idea that, I, the basic argument that I'm making is, is that just like you want a network perimeter device to watch all the bytes flowing in and out and make some action, I, the argument is, is that you also want some sort of visibility into what's going on in your host. If you treat your host like a black box, it's a problem, right? If you say, well, I'll just look at the bytes going to and fro and that'll be enough, it isn't, right? And if you say, well, something went wrong with that box, I'll pull it offline and do the whole file physics and forensics, that's a problem too. Because it takes a long time, it's very tedious, it's very expensive, and it's ultimately incomplete through no fault of the discipline, through no fault of the people doing it, but just because that data is not always there. The disk is not an infinite store of everything that ever happened all the time. Right? So we need some sort of additional visibility into that. What is that going to give us? Nothing. Right? Just more data at first, right? And you already have plenty of data. But it's the first step, right, to having that data to be able to manipulate it and slice it and dice it and cut it and look for trends to allow you some sort of visibility that you can act on. And the big difference here is, is that there's no difference. You could walk to the computer or RDP to it or whatever, right? And write your own little script and use PS exec and run it, right? You can do all that and you can say, what's going on that computer right now? What's going on that computer right now? You can run all that, but that's very painstaking, right? It takes you a long time. And then when you run it all, um, what are you going to run? So you have an idea. You think, well, I'm going to look to see if there's a process named bad, you know, bad.exe, right? <laughs> I'm going to look. So I'm going to write your script, and that takes you, we'll call it two hours, right? And then you're like, ah, I'd like to run it, um, but the IT guys, they're not going to let me, so i got to sneak in the back door with this PS exec thing that I have going on because I have domain admin that I didn't tell them about. And so then you run it across the whole thing, right? And you, and you, and you get back all your results, and then you take a look, and you putz around, and you, you know, there's some false positives, and you go through all that. And then that took you another two days, and you say, that, that, that wasn't a good idea. <laughs> right? I mean, it's not, it's just, you didn't know. It took you all that time, all that friction, all that scale, just to find out that it wasn't a great idea. Now you want to refine your idea. You want to say, I wasn't bad at EXE I was looking for. I was looking for bad one dot EXE. Now I got to do the whole again. It costs another two days. So the real question is, how can we compress all that down so that when you have an idea, something unique to your organization, how can you just look and see what's going on and, and find out right away, is that happening? How is it happening? What is the characteristics of how it's happening? Let me refine my own understanding of my own environment. And you already do that on the network, right, to some degree, depending on you know, how involved you are in your perimeter devices. But you have that visibility and you have that action ability. The argument is you want to look at that on the other side as well. Um, oh, sorry, one back one. So push traditional forensics way to the right. By, by that, what I mean is, is that the idea is, is that instead of jumping directly from, I didn't detect it, then I, it smacked me in the face, so I had no choice but to acknowledge it, and then go right to the file system forensics. Let's try to, the file system forensic has its place. There's no way around it. It will always be around because it will always be a, a needed discipline. But if you push it to the right, by, what, by pushing it to the right, what I mean, I guess, is that, is that you're reserving it for, for more desperate cases, right? You're reserving it for times when another set of capabilities that you have now in front of that can be used instead. So you say, hey, let me ask the question quickly, easily, um, and cheaply, both in terms of time and money, and then if it doesn't give me all the data I need, yes, now I need to go 
go pull out the disc, but at least make that the last resort instead of the first approach. I think I'm just about done. So I, I think this is probably it. Um, that last point, the best forensics are those that are not needed, right? Again, we're never going to, my argument, we're never going to get to the point in practical terms where you say, oh yeah, we don't need forensics anymore, right? It's never going to happen. But the less often you need them, that implies that either A, you're completely blinded and don't want to acknowledge anything, right? Or it means you're saying, I have enough data, I have enough tools, I have enough capability that I don't need to resort to that, right? I can more easily go back and use some other set of data to answer the questions I need to figure out ahead of time. I think that should be just about it. That's it. So I think I'm 42 minutes in. Look at that. Yep. Um, so you guys have two options from my perspective. You can leave and not listen to me anymore. Or you can ask questions, and I'm good either way. So thanks for listening. I appreciate the time.